Hello, welcome to Music Ally Focus with me, Music Ally's editor, Joe Sparrow. And in this episode, we're joined by Kat Henry, executive director of the US-based nonprofit philanthropic organization, Live Music Society. We chat to Kat about the society's mission, which it describes as to recognize and protect small venues and listening rooms across the United States so that live music can remain accessible to all. Now, each Music Ally Focus episode analyzes one meaningful music business story at a time. And so this podcast is going to be quick. It should take about the same amount of time as might hypothetically take our old friend Andre Altolf to eat 20 kilos of fruit cobbler. Andre, ever committed to his task, ate 352 grams of fruit cobbler in 30 seconds in 2018. And for you completists out there, the fruit in that cobbler was cherry. Now, talking of cherries on the cake, a small venue where people can gather and enjoy music can be one of the most enjoyable things to any local community. However, small venues have been truly under the cosh in recent years. Not only did the COVID-19 lockdown punish them particularly hard, but a changing gigging environment and large increases in their bills has meant that in 2023, running a small venue is very hard work. Kat tells us about the state of the small venue community in the USA, the threats and challenges that they face, and why small venues are so important to the people who love them. Let's go and speak to Kat now. Right, well, I'm extremely pleased to welcome Kat Henry from Live Music Society onto the podcast. Hello, Kat. Hi. Hi, it's great to be here. Yes, great to have you. Now, before we we talk about what you're doing in terms of uh, the society, and can you give us some sort of um, some of the basics about you and who you are? Uh, what you're doing, what the Live Music Society is, and what you do for them. Okay. Uh, I'll start with Live Music Society. It's a, a, a philanthropic organization, a nonprofit foundation. It's been around since January of 2020, not the most auspicious time to uh, launch an organization, but it was uh, seeded from an idea that the board of directors had in 2019. Um, The founder is a touring musician and was touring small clubs um, as a support act and and just fell in love with these amazing spaces throughout the United States. Uh, Many, I heard a lot of stories about how hard it is and thought, well, you know, I have have the capacity to help, so I'm going to help out. And I've got a bunch of friends together and formed a board and they launched in uh, 2020, but about six weeks before lockdown um, and then, you know, shifted gears into supporting music venues in whatever way was possible. Uh, I joined in the summer of 2021 um, and ran a grant round of emergency funding. It was our third grant round. Um, My background is in music. I'm a music lifer, uh, raised in rural England, but, you know, migrated to the big city as soon as I could and uh, came up through the illegal warehouse party scene in the late 80s, uh, where I lo- learned everything I needed to know about how to run an event and um, and keep people safe, and then came to New York in 1990 and spent about 10 years being a lounge singer <laughs> and learning about jazz and falling in love with New York jazz and, and American music in general and learning the history, the amazing history of American music and went to college here in New York at New School and then from then went to Lincoln Center with the major performing arts center in Manhattan and spent uh, 20 years there um, programming, producing as a stage manager, as a concert producer um, and finally running a team of producers, um, touring a jazz orchestra and running a jazz club, a small club. And so, um, the, you know, working with small venues is definitely part of my background as well. Yes, I was going to say, like a lot of appropriate uh, experience for uh, Live Music Society and the mission around small venues. Um, perhaps you can tell us then sort of, before we start digging into what exactly the state of small venues are in, in the US at the moment and, and what's going on, what is Live Music Society doing in terms of providing support and, and helping at the moment? 
Yeah, well, we had some soul searching after, you know, as people aren't really sure exactly when the pandemic kind of ended. It, people thought it was over and then it wasn't really over. Right? <laughs> um, and so we continued to do emergency funding. We gave away uh, uh, over $2 million in the first two years of operation to 126 small venues that in, in some respects man- made them survive the pandemic after months and months and months of closure. Um, and after that third grant round, which was wrapped up in mid-2022, um, we did some you know, facilitation of uh, strategic planning of like, wh- who are we? What do we do? What, what is our mission? And we, and we settled on the idea of recognizing and protecting small venues and listening rooms throughout the United States. And by small venues, often they're called grassroots venues. I think that's a UK term that Mark David from Music Venue Trust uses. These grassroots places, but generally under 300 capacity, above 50, even though there's a lot of diversity within that capacity number, um, and looked at ways that we can celebrate what they're doing, provide visibility for them, and support them in their great ideas and make it possible to um, improve the experience, we say, improve the live music experience for the musicians, the staff who work there, and the audience. So we just launched this year our very first uh, Music in Action grant. Um, and we ran that we it, throughout the spring and announced our 17 grantees in, in June. And it's a community development, audience development grant, uh, you know, in some respects, bringing people back into venues who were hesitant, you know, after the pandemic, people needed to relearn how to congregate, Um, but also to give them the opportunity to take a chance on an idea that they wouldn't otherwise have the seed money to do. Uh, So that's our Music in Action grant. We can dig into that a little bit more with 17 amazing venues across the U.S., um, and we we also ran a smaller grant. Out. We have two signature grants. The other one's called Toolbox. And the Toolbox grant is a smaller grant. It's for more practical things. Uh, you know, people need to redo their electrics or, you know, build a stage. Or in some respects, the, the first ones were building outdoor spaces for music to be performed right, in the summertime. And we've just launched our second version of the Toolbox grant. And so it's open now. Uh, venues can apply for up to $10,000 for something. It can be, you know, uh, consulting on marketing, uh, us hiring a social media person or something as, you know, like building a bathroom for, it, for the artists right. or improving your green room. Very practical. Okay. Things. I'll, I will put a link to both those things next to the podcast and people can check them out. Uh, if, they, if that sounds like a good idea, which it does, of course. Now, let me just take a moment to tell you that last year, Music Ally launched a series of five free courses covering everything you need to know about Amazon Music for Artists, including programming and curation, selling artist merchandise, understanding voice technology, reaching audiences via Alexa, and live streaming on Twitch. Supported by Amazon Music, these courses are all completely free to access. And now, thanks to Amazon's support, we are also able to offer complimentary certification to any individual or company that completes all five courses. So, what have you got to lose? Nothing. That's what? Because they're free. You can find the link to the Amazon Music for Artists series in our show notes beneath the podcast. Before we move on to sort of how the small venues have been affected in recent years, why why are they so important? Why is this something that's really worth spending the time and, and the money to to support small venues? I mean, that's a huge question, but the 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 best way I can answer it from a very personal point of view is there are spaces where magic happens, right? There's there, most of my musical memories are in these small creative spaces where you can see a, a guitarist had to change their guitar string or 
or start a song over again because they screwed it up. <laughs> you know, it's it's a very intimate space. And aside from their role in the in the larger music industry as an incubator for for new artists, you know, that's a that's a huge part of it. But the aspect uh, that we're really interested in, in is as community spaces. You know, kind of communal congregating spaces. Uh, we support nonprofits and for profits. There's not a lot of support for for profit spaces, but at that size, the the margins are so negligible that, and they're often run by people who were touring musicians, you know, who came in from the cold or aged out of that, you know, uh, touring touring life, and are run by really passionate people, and they're important because especially out of the cities and even in the cities, you look at places like Bushwick where there's like a local community that can gather around and their meeting spaces. Um, and, you know, the, the, the trope, it still exists that you can see somebody close up that will then become extremely famous and you can say, I saw them when, right? Um, but it's a great experience. It's a lovely experience for the musicians and for the audiences. A great hey. night out, we say. Yes, no, no, I ask, we can all agree on that. Now, how have then, this is a, a US-focused uh, initiative you're talking about, how have small venues been affected in the US in recent years? Obviously, there's been closures. Obviously, there's been COVID, sort of the big obvious uh, um, impacts. But what are the, when venues don't survive, what are, and what are the impacts then of them closing? So what, like, what is the state of, state of play of small venues in the US? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm located in in New York, where there's a bunch of venues, and and some people might cynically say, well, if one closes, you know, another one will pop up in its place pretty soon. Um, but in smaller towns, in the tertiary touring markets, in rural areas, if that one space doesn't operate, then that's it. There's nothing there, and in spaces and 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 towns across these states where, you know, Main Street has become a little bit more homogenized, right? There's the chains and there's not that much that differentiates one space or one region from another. These are unique. These are like really centered on the music scene that is around them. And, um, and, a, and as I said, it's a gathering space for community. They don't usually just present music. They'll do classes and and you know art shows and it's a it's an artistic center of their community and then for the you know the secondary and primary markets you know places like milwaukee um and chicago it's it's essential to the development of an artist's career you know where they tour and get out and and develop their craft and their audiences so that loss is uh is, is both very local, but also has national repercussions. And, and what the small venues are fighting against is the, is the control of music. Um, it is becoming more and more in the hands of some very, very large corporations. And, it, and they are kind of being overwhelmed by that, that, that the smaller independent venues have a very unique space, but they're fighting some very powerful uh, forces that uh, you know want to take over the market in you know in many many areas of the states. Perhaps you can expand on that a bit then, because we, we obviously we've we all understand the impact that COVID has had on on venues and it's been fairly devastating in many ways. But what are the other sort of those kind of external, if you like, uh, forces from, well, you mentioned there, like the, the big businesses, but what are those What are those other forces that are putting pressure on small venues and what impact has it had? Well, you know, if you, if you run a small venue and you're looking at inflation, you're looking at, and sometimes people need to be taught that, that it's important to pay for music. If people aren't often aware that it, that's important. And and in some respects, many owners are approached by uh, larger business interests, and and they're just not making it work. So they'll they'll sell out to a place that is uh, 
you know, a multinational or, or, you know, a larger organization and they, and they lose that, they lose that control over what's presented in their space or they, or they just, you know, give up because it's very hard to make that model work. A lot of, a lot of music venues rely on our liquor sales, alcohol sales to, to make ends meet. And so there's this, there's this space where, um, you know, if you're trying to make sure that the artists get paid, that you have to kind of look at the, the economics of it, um, and which is why there's a lot of bars that ask artists to pass a hat. We, we don't really condone that. Um, but it is a part of the music, music scene. Um, we're looking at supporting places that have found a way to make it work so that artists get paid properly and that, um, that there's a, there's a, a place where independent and new artists can can thrive and, and survive. And and it's true, like the larger spaces, not so much the smaller spaces, but the 500, 600, maybe 1,000 capacity venues um, are being bought up by larger music interests and, and they are controlling a lot of the way that artists tour around the United States. And it takes those artists out of the loop for the smaller venues. What, from, so from your your position, then you're, you're providing support and assistance to try and help venues become to su- sustain their position as this what you've described as a really important community center, um, but also you know you're you're helping them evolve and and become more sort of sustainable businesses in that sense what in in your sort of position then do you think that the future of the small venue ecosystem the universe of them across the u.s looks like because you know, it's it's if you read a lot of stories about small venues or it sounds very negative you know the pressures are very very high that like you said the, the margins are razor thin and and it's really hard it can be a really hard thing to run i have tons of sympathy for and empathy for people who do it you know because it's often driven by passion uh, as much as anything so what what does the, the the future of that space look like and and, and what you know it, does it look positive or are we sort of do we is this work that needs to be done yeah i think i think it is positive you know there's been a couple of um uh surveys and studies done i think you highlighted one on on your website bands in town talking about people want to get out here like music right? There's there's a there's a market for it. I have a teenager. She didn't she didn't come up through that regular route because she was stuck indoors and now she's like desperate to get out and have these live music experiences. So I think it's really optimistic. And um, there's a whole new group of youngsters making music, seeing music, creating in these especially these DIY spaces that are popping up all over the place. Um, um it's it's a very very creative um, flow of, of, of things happening right now, which is which is very exciting. Um, I think music venue owners, by necessity, have to be in, in ingenious in the way that they look at their revenue streams. And I've we've I've gotten to know so many over the past couple of years who are you know, building, have an Airbnb, like a, a rental that they use for their artists, but they can, they can create revenue streams outside of the, of their business. And they're, and they're being clever about that. I think, I think they're not going to go anywhere. There's AI, AI has replaced and will replace a lot of things, but I'm not sure that they can replace, you know, <laughs> that solo guitarist sitting in a spotlight, you know, with people sitting, listening, or, you know, a, a punk band, you know, in front of a mosh pit. <laughs> AI AI can't replace that. And and it's a an elemental, I believe it's a fundamental human need. You know, you go back uh, without be- becoming too esoteric, you know, like the heartbeat being the, the original drum beat. Making music, hearing music is is an essential part of what it means to be live. We believe, a live music society, that it is at the center of what it means to be alive. And sometimes even if people don't realize that, when they're around it, it can be very uh, a revelation to, to feel 
alive when you're around music. So I feel like they're not going to go anywhere and they'll continue to look, be, be clever about how they make things work. Yeah. I mean, going back then to the two sort of flagship um, campaigns that you're running, which involve redistributing um, money to small venues, what does success look like there to you? I mean, you, you're helping them evolve in different ways, in practical ways and in sort of um, a bit of sort of uh, leap of faith ways of trying to do something new. What, what does success look like in the future if, if that all works well? Well, I think it's all about audience development. You work with emerging artists. Artists, you have to find your people. And small venues are, are the same. And as they partner with artists to bring people to their space and providing a really unique experience, people will come back. And so our Music in Action grant is about developing the capacity to just do something exciting to bring people into your space or to do something that shows that you really care. Um, we've got, a, you know, we have a special focus on inclusivity. So we have venues such as the Stone Church in Brattleboro, Vermont. Uh, it's a rural uh, venue, but every year, and this is, we're funding the second year of this, um, they have this thing called Girls to the Front, and it's women, women non-binary led bands. And then Girls in the Booth is an associated program, it's a four-week low-cost program to train women in um, sound engineering and, and lighting and just concert production. And then on the other side of the country, you've got spaces like the Ivy Room in Albany, California, which is very successful, um, very much part of their community. And they are um, an a, a LGBTQ space um, that that is going to have a pride festival throughout next June to be able to not just bring music in, but to be ha- to have mental health clinics and and employment workshops and support for their community. Um, so this is what success looks like: that you that you that people who come to your venue understands that it's not just a commercial transaction. You don't just want them to do the two drink minimum and then you know get out. This is this is something about building relationships and really caring about people that um, transcends ideological differences, which I think is very sorely needed in the states at the moment. You know, when you come together in music, you can leave all of those things behind. It's a very it's a very collective experience um, that can that can bring people together in a way that other things can't. Mm. Yeah, and these small venues are the the connecting points for for all those as well. When I mean, artists move between them, they they're connecting with new communities who are and then those con- communities are connected, which is sort of uh, growth of the idea, isn't it? Um, so I will put some links to to, to both of these uh, these these funds or the grants, I guess they are. Um, yeah, and people can uh, have a look for themselves. Um, but then one final question before I leave you um it goes back to music which is handy uh if you can't if you could only listen to one piece of music for the rest of your life what would it be i i think i would listen to um i love supreme ah, by john yes. coltrane that would be something that every time every time i listen to it i hear new things it's reflective of so much emotion and peace and um and expand and expansiveness that yeah i've listened to it an awful lot and i could listen to it many more times but yeah it's a fantastic i will will put a link to that as well absolutely Uh, interesting actually people do i'm not sure if john coltrane has been chosen before i'm sure uh but people often choose things that they they hear a lot of new things every time in so it's yeah. it's that balance of something they enjoy and getting value for money out of something that you're only going to be able to listen to uh, right. over and over yeah. again and it's a spiritual it's a spiritual experience you know there's a church there's a church in San Francisco the church of John Coltrane where where um right. he's considered he's considered a, a saint a patron saint and his that spirituality is celebrated. I've once I, didn't I haven't know that. been there. I'd like to go there. <laughs> no, that sounds great. I'm uh, I haven't ventured in a church for a long time, but that one sounds pretty good. So uh something something to aim for. 
but this is like a church that is a small venue at the same time. I mean, you could argue most churches are small venues in a yeah, sense, I guess, true. can you? So there you go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Great. Uh, Kat Henry, thanks ever so much uh, for joining us here on the Focus Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure. All right. That's it. Big thanks to Kat. And you'll find links to uh, her and her work beneath the podcast. And if you found that useful, please do share the podcast on with someone else who you think will find it helpful. And if you want to get in touch with me, I would love to hear from you. Email me on joe, J-O-E, at musically.com. Don't forget, we also have a free weekly email called The Knowledge, which flops into your inbox every Friday and rounds up a soup song of the best analysis, news, marketing insight, and skills from across all of Music Ally's industry-leading services. So sign up and impress your boss. Links to that and everything else are in the description beneath the podcast, as always. Right, that's it. Uh, thank you, as ever, for listening. I've been Music Ally's editor, Joe Sparrow. You have been you. And until next time, farewell. <laughs>